Hello and welcome to episode 516 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. It's Monster Kid Radio and I am Monster Kid Radio's host, producer, writer, and just guy doing what I do here. I'm Derek M. Cook. Welcome to the show and welcome to the band, The Neptunas. This is the song Nancy Drew's Wetsuit. It's from their album Mermaid A Go Go. You can find out more about the Neptunas at theneptunas.bandcamp.com. They're a surf band based out of Los Angeles, California, and they gave us permission to play their music here on the show. This week, you'll hear the song in its entirety at the end of the episode. Welcome to the show, everybody. How's everybody doing? So, what are we talking about this week? Well, of course, we've got a beta capsule review from my man Mark Matsky, and it's really important because it is now... Wow, it is now time to dive into Ultraman proper. We've been dancing around it. We've been doing Ultra Q, and last week we talked a little bit, or excuse me, he talked a little bit, and I say he because it's really all credit to him. He talked a little bit about what Subaraya did between Ultra Q and Ultraman gearing up to it. We are now into episode one of the very first Ultraman series. You're going to want to listen to it because it's awesome. Kenny is also here with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, which does tie into the main subject today. The main subject today? Well, you know, it's this recording that I did back in October, maybe of last year, maybe the year before. It's been a long time. It's been sitting on my hard drive forever. This is a recording that I did with Mark Bailey. He's an animator. He's a great friend of the show, filmmaker, uh, just monster kid, just wonderful dude. And he and I recorded an episode about Plan 9 from Outer Space a little bit, and mostly about Ed Wood and Ed Wood fandom and what he calls the fandom and love of bad movies. And it's something that I never released. My intention actually was to release it as part of the Plan 9 by 9 podcast that Scott Morrison and I did a while back when we were breaking down the movie Plan 9 from Outer Space nine minutes at a time. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes to that podcast website if you want to check that out, if you didn't check it out the first time around. Anyway, Mark and I recorded this, and I had always intended to put it out that way, and I just never did. So, let's do it now. Better late than never, right? So we have a long conversation with Mark Bailey talking about Ed Wood, the love of Ed Wood. Was Ed Wood really the quote-unquote worst director of all time? You'll have to listen to this conversation uh, for yourself to hear what he thinks, and I think you probably already know what I think about Ed Wood's place in pop culture history. It's a fun conversation, and uh, just big thanks to Mark for being part of that. So that's coming up. But before all of that, we have a little bit of feedback, so why don't we dive into that real quick? You have some voicemails here. This first voicemail is in response to a question that sometimes comes up when we play the Classic Five here. The question is, what classic monster movie would make a great theme park attraction? Well, the caller didn't just do one theme park attraction. He went through the whole theme park. Check it out. Hey, Derek. Hey, group. Captain Billy here. Uh, that's a um, theme park ride uh, based on a classic horror film question from the uh, Fabulous Five. Uh, here's some thoughts. The uh, Tunnel of Mad Love, of course. The Amazing Colossal Man's Log Flume. I don't want to tell you where that splashes down. The Life-Size Kaiju Merry-Go-Round. Uh, when you get too hot in the afternoon, you can stop by the Psycho Splash Pad next to the Bad Seed Lagoon, and the kids can go play off in Little Maria's Marsh. Uh, when you get hungry, stop by the Night of the Living Dead All-You-Can-Eat Buffet with the King of the Spider Omelet Bar. And then make sure you stop by the Midway to visit the Target's Shooting Gallery. And, of course, the most obvious attraction, make sure you visit the Cannibal Holocaust Petting Zoo. Duh. Bye. Okay, I was right there with you, Captain Billy. I was digging it. I was like, okay, I want to go. This sounds like fun. And then we got to the Cannibal Holocaust Petting Zoo. Oh. Ugh. Fortunately, Cannibal Holocaust is clearly outside the Monster Kid Radio wheelhouse. And this is the very last time I'm ever going to bring it up here on this show because that movie is disturbing. Otherwise, I'm all in, man. Let's go to the, the monster movie uh, theme park that Captain Billy just designed. I love it. Let's do it. All right, we also had another voicemail that came in in response to last Saturday's Monster Kid Movie Club, where we crossed over with Gary Khan and showed a bunch of classic monster movies. During that event, it wasn't just me introducing the films or hosting the films. Stephen D. Sullivan, great friend of the show, been on the show quite a bit, was introducing a number of the films as well. And there seemed to be some confusion about 
some of his re- introductions regarding Roger Corman. So Steve is here to clear it all up. Hey, Monster Kids. This is Steve Sullivan. Following up on last week's Monster Kid Movie Club, Gary Con stream. I had a great time, and I hope you did too. I wanted to clear something up that confused my wife. When I talk about a Roger Corman film, that's a pretty broad category because Roger Corman not only directed films, but he also produced films. Every time I said this was a Roger Corman film, my wife wrongly assumed that I was saying that he had directed the film, when in fact I was talking sometimes about films that he and his brother Gene had put together. There's so many of them. And I group, I tend to group them all together in my head, though honestly the ones that Roger Corman directs himself tend to be better. So in case anyone else was confused, a Roger Corman film means a lot of, a lot of things to me. So, uh, so that's the explanation of that. Just watched Godzilla vs. Kong. Really, really enjoyed it. It's kind of a mad funhouse roller coaster ride film. Great popcorn film. Enjoyed it a lot. I hope that everyone listening to Monster Kid Radio is enjoying Atomic Tales. If you are, let us and let Derek know. We're planning on keeping doing it, and uh, hopefully it'll be around for a while. So have a great week, a great weekend, and everybody stay safe out there. Steve Sullivan, signing off. For the record, I am not the person who said that Steve's wife was wrong. That was Steve. So, Kiff... Just for the record, that wasn't me. I'm just saying. (laughs) Steve, thanks for calling him in. I knew what you meant. I think most everybody knew what you meant. But, you know, in case you didn't know what Steve meant, that's what Steve meant. Also, Atomic Tales, that is the radio drama style story that I've been running here on the show. We played a little bit of it last week. And there are some more that I'm going to play in the future. Like next week, we're going to do another installment. If you like what you hear, let me know. And then I'll let Steve and Christopher Mim know, since he's the person that produces the segment. And we can see about running more of them here on the show. I appreciate you guys calling in. Of course, if anybody has any comments about anything we've talked about here on the show or would even like to answer a Classic 5 question, this is how you get a hold of us. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at... 503-810-5MKR That's 503-810-5657 Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com And no, there's no Classic 5 this week because like I said, that recording that I did with Mark was intended for plan nine by nine and we weren't doing the classic five there before we get into the rest of the show i just want to let everybody know that coming up this weekend in the monster kid movie club which you can find at monsterkidmovie.club or twitch.tv slash monster kid radio we're doing another big old block of monster movies except this time they're not quite monster movies it's more murder and mystery Um, I don't know what that voice was. Anyway, we're going to be showing some movies that feature more murder and mystery than monsters, but that doesn't mean there's not monster connections in the movies that we're showing. For example, One Body Too Many, Bela Lugosi's in that flick. We're going to be showing a Joshua Kennedy Sherlock Holmes film and a number of other movies. You'll want to head over to twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio to check out the channel trailer to learn a little bit more about what's showing. I'll tell you now that it starts at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, That's the pre-show. The movies themselves start right around noon. Of course, I'll be popping in off and on throughout the day to kind of check in with everybody and just have a live conversation with people because there is a live chat. There will be a prize giveaway. There will be some live Classic 5 playing. It's just going to be a good time, and I look forward to you joining us over there if you can. Follow the link in the show notes, or like I said, just go to twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio or monsterkidmovie.club. Let's go ahead and get on with the rest of the show. We got Mark's Beta Capital Review, Kenny's Look at Famous Monsters of Film, and Mark Bailey, and all things Ed Wood. Right now. Genesis to the modern screen is the name written in blood. Ega! If I could just call you 
on the phone. Thrill to the newest recording star, Arturo Jr. You rock house on the brown Crazy things happen to the See ravishing Marilyn Manning in a thrilling, chilling story. <laughs> the last of the prehistoric giants sees his first girl, Noah. And <laughs> Curious newsmen search deep in giant country for the last of the ancient cavemen. See a tough giant, tamed by the soft hands of his captive woman. See him sacrifice his ageless beard for her love. The loser to a boy in a dune buggy, escaping a burning desert. Ega's primitive passion was love or kill. Hear Ega talk, the ancient language of love, used at the beginning of time. See Ega. It is safe to state that the grandchildren of some of the people in this theater will not be born on Earth. They come from the bowels of hell. A transformed race of walking dead. Zombies guided by a master plan for complete domination of the Earth. Plan 9 from outer space. Starring the most frightmarish cast ever. Bella Lugosi, the seductive vampira, and Thor Johnson as the walking dead. Turn off your electro gun! No! Bullets bounce off their bodies. Rockets, missiles, jets cannot stop their death ship. What earthly power can stop this terror? For a glimpse of things to come, see this blast of screen suspense. For it could be happening right now. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Full color swirls slow to a stop, spelling a familiar title, Ultra Q. But then, in an explosion of red, a new title takes its place, Ultraman fantasy special effects series accompanied by a wild orchestral stab. Then, a fanfare plays, setting up the theme song, introduced at the birth of Ultraman's stage show, and the episode card reads, Ultra Operation Number One. As the song is sung, silhouetted images promise monsters and aliens to come, while the lyrics tell of a hero from the land of light, ready to fight for the sake of justice. As the tune comes to a bombastic stop, one last card reads, featuring space monster Bemuller. One can only imagine the anticipation of the youngsters lucky enough to tune in Sunday evening, July 17, 1966. They were immediately rewarded with a chase scene as a red spherical UFO chases a blue orb through the sky. The red sphere accidentally collides with the patrol aircraft of Science Special Search Party pilot Shin Hayata. His ship goes down in flames, sending the rest of the Science Patrol on a desperate search to find their comrade. Meanwhile, the alien entity responsible for the crash resurrects Hayata by fusing his life force to the human, 
and gives him an object called the Beta Capsule, which will call forth the superhero's full power when needed, but only for a few minutes. The timing couldn't be better as the occupant of the blue orb, Space Monster Bemuller, emerges from a nearby lake, terrorizing the countryside. The Science Patrol uses a lot of their signature weapons technology before Hayata tries out the Beta Capsule for the very first time. Simply put, Ultra Operation No. 1 sets the paradigm that would carry through over five decades of existence. A human or human-like host, typically a member of a Japanese defense force, is brought back from the brink of death by an Ultra being. When threatened by giant monsters or alien invaders, the human uses an object of some kind to initiate a transformation into an Ultraman, when all other options have been exhausted and the human host tends to keep this ability a secret from their teammates for quite some time. Already in Ultra Operation No. 1, we begin to get a sense of the team members' personalities, and their vehicles are on full display from the word go, including a couple different aircraft and a submarine. And finally, Ultraman fires his iconic Spacium Ray for the first time, using a pose that was soon to be imitated on playgrounds everywhere. One quick fact worth noting, Episode 1 was co-written by Shinichi Sekizawa, who was the screenwriter of 1961's Mothra, as well as 10 Godzilla movies, including King Kong vs. Godzilla. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Mansky reporting. When the forces of nature erupt, the ocean floor opens up and five men and one woman are hurtled 15 miles straight down to latitude zero. Discover the incredible space age world of tomorrow at latitude zero. Activate your elevation. Discover the undersea metropolis, the battle of the flying submarines, the attack of the giant mutants, and discover the unbelievable human transplant, a live woman's brain into the body of a beast. Latitude Zero, where man's future explodes 15 miles beneath the sea. From National General Pictures in color rated G, general audiences. King Kong versus Godzilla. Nothing you've ever seen can equal the thrills of this extraordinary motion picture. Nothing you've ever felt can equal its awesome fury as the mightiest monsters of the ages clash in the battle of the century. It sears the emotions with shock and terror. It staggers the imagination. All new in color. King Kong versus Godzilla. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Plan 9 from Outer Space was featured briefly in early issues of FM, but today we are going to look at two of its most famous players, Vampira and Tor Johnson. We first hear of Vampira in an article from 1958's FM2 about horror hosts. And to think this vogue for vampires as monsters of ceremonies all began in that suburb of Lagosi Angeles known as Hollywood, when a vamp named Vampira crawled out of a coffin and into the hearts of her hearty fans. Little did she dream what a stake she had in the future. When last seen, she was driving that away in a black shrouded chariot. Who's? It looked like Ben Hearst. She is mentioned in a 1965 news item from Monster World 4, also known as FM73. Myla Vampira Nermi is finished with show business, at least. That's what she told us. To begin with, her impressions of Hollywood completely changed once she saw what a bad deal Filmland gave Bela Lugosi. They refused to give him a chance to display his fullest acting potential, and they practically dropped him like a hot potato back in the early 1950s, when horror films temporarily lost their kick. The majority of Hollywood's who's who unjustly tagged him as a has-been, oblivious of the fact that Bella had countless fans and admirers all over the world. If this is what Hollywood is like, no thank you. Her newest endeavor is briefly mentioned three issues later. Myla Nurmi, the spooky brunette who rose to fame as TV's Vampira, has opened a Hollywood antique shop called Sheer Madness. Tor Johnson was mentioned in FM 38 from April of 1966, 
where he was part of a visit to local stores to promote Don Post rubber mask, along with FM editor Forey Ackerman. Here is how his appearance was described. Then comes the star of the show, all hundreds and hundreds of pounds of him. The rumor is absolutely true that he has to stand on two scales to weigh himself once. He's the monster of Yucca Flats, the man mountain of the unearthly, the friend of Bela Lugosi, who played it opposite him in Bride of the Atom, and the friend of Vampira, who played opposite her in Plan 9 from Outer Space. The one, the only, Tor Johnson. With gray pasty face, bald head, missing tooth, and scar slash face, Tor lumbers onto the scene, daring and delighting fans all over the place. After his passing, May 12, 1971, his obituary appeared in FM 90. It was a brief tribute of four pages with seven pictures. Apparently, his passing was not publicized, and the news got to foray through a long grapevine that included Tor's nephew, Bella's last wife, Bella's superfan Richard Sheffield, and makeup artist Vern Langdon, who confirmed his death by visiting his grave. Here are some highlights from the tribute. He weighed 320 pounds in his prime, and if he somewhat resembled a hippopotamus in human form, he also had a heart as big as one. Tor loved children and was as eager to bring them squeals of delight as he was to bring shivers of fright to grown-ups. Complaining of pain in his stomach, 48 hours after he entered the hospital, he died peacefully in a coma on May 12, 1971. He will be remembered for his pictures, The Unearthly, The Ghost Catcher, The Beast of Yucca Flats, The Lady in the Iron Mask, Plan 9 from Outer Space, The Black Sleep, and Bride of the Monster. And by those of us fortunate enough to know him personally, for the twinkle in his eye when he set out to terrify. The tribute was followed by a reprint of the film book for Tor's classic, Black Sleep. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Beyond any terror ever known, the Black Sleep, it wakes the dead. Five of the screen's greatest horror thrill stars, Basil Rathbone, Akim Tamirov, Lon Chaney, John Carradine, Bella Lugosi, and these beautiful women in their power. <laughs> Pass through a madman's hellfire. Enter an ancient abbey's secret passage into the most terrifying tortured dungeon from the medieval past. Shocking victims of a famous brain specialist gone berserk. Plunging you into a reign of terror. That's cerebral fluid. But that means this man is alive. He is alive. This is criminal. Monstrous. Mungo! Why not use her? Put her on the black sleep. Take it up to surgery at once. A horror beyond belief, feeding on beauty, <laughs> lusting to claw the world apart. Unearthly takes you into horror beyond imagination. Starring John Carradine, a mad menace to humanity, as the scientist possessed by a passion to remake people. Alison Hayes, the beauty slated to be his next victim. Now, my dear, tell me what's bothering you. I don't know, Doctor. I'm just frightened all the time. You mustn't be afraid, not of anything. I want you to have absolute confidence in me. Trust me implicitly. I have found out how now to add to the 16 existing glands a 17th. Artificially developed a new gland. What this gland does to this blonde beauty when it's electrolyted into her body is an experience in horror almost unbelievable. Now listen, you and Grace take the main road into town. Remember, stay in the shadows till you're clear of the house. Ah! 
I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a serialized monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror films. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos, The Hands of Fate, and the original chill role-playing game. My goal is to recreate the thrills of the monster vs. monster films that we all love. We'll have vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, and scheming madmen. And that's just in the first storyline. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors and other monster stories sent directly to your email for as little as a dollar a month. For just two dollars, you'll get all the chapters in advance, plus bonus stories and other perks. Sign up now at CushingHorrors.com or visit SDSullivan.com for a Patreon link. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again. And remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. I wanted to take a break from doing the uh, sectional reviews of Plan 9 from Outer Space and, and stop looking at the sections of films and actually talk to somebody who loves the movie and loves Ed Wood and has given presentations about Ed Wood. I'd like to welcome to Plan 9x9, Nine Nine, Mark Bailey from Foxtrot Studios. How you doing, hey, man? Hey, Derek. I love what you've done with the place. This is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'll take credit for all of the decorating uh, you know, decisions around here. Unless you didn't like it, then I'm going to blame it on uh, Scott. That, that is fair. I will keep my, my gripes towards Scott. Uh, he, <laughs> conveniently, he's not here. Exactly. That's, so it works yeah, out perfectly. Yeah, I can see your management style. I like that. <laughs> Very cutthroat. <laughs> Foxtrot Studios. Uh, listeners, if you haven't checked this out, I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. Mark makes these really fun, short, animated movies and has won an award for at least one of them. I did. At last year's G-Fest. Uh, they're just they're fun little animations. The investment of time that you're going to have uh, to watch one of these things is going to be more than paid off because they're just, they're fun. Like I said, you, you are a monster kid. Oh, yeah. You're a fan of giant monsters, you know, and all of that gets woven into these fun little short movies. Right. It takes me a year to make one short film because I work and I'm married and my wife and I just bought a house and, you know, life has expenses and, and responsibilities. So I, I wake up uh, every morning and try to devote like one hour a day towards my short films. And sometimes I could do it. Sometimes I can't. But I'm also a, a very big fan of Plan 9 from Outer Space and Ed Wood. Which is why I wanted to have you on here. I mean, we've been talking about Ed Wood and Plan 9, I think, off mic through Facebook Messenger and such for well, for a long time. Yes, we have. I, I think we even mentioned it. I was on Monster Kid Radio for an episode, and I did mention that I wrote a, a term paper. I wrote a paper for Ed Wood that actually helped me graduate college. So, um, And I'm back in school now, and I'm looking forward to finding a way to weave Ed Wood into one of my courses and because uh, it's just something I can go on and on about. And uh, it's if I can say Ed would help me graduate college again, I'd be very pleased. That would be amazing. Isn't that fun? <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Right on, man. Thank you. Thank you. I was very excited when I discovered that you and Scott were going to start the Plan 9 by 9 podcast. And, and um, I do a presentation called Bad Film A Go Go. One of the slides in my in this presentation has podcasts about bad movies and there are three of them, and you were on the top, and you hadn't even produced an episode yet. You only had like a, a small uh, bumper, small trailer, and I'm like, you guys have to see this, please, 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 please. So I've been promoting your work for since before you actually had some content beyond the the introduction. So wow, um, yeah, yeah. And so uh, can I ask who the other two podcasts were? One is called Good Beer Bad Movie Night with Pete. Kent. I think you met him recently at Monster Bash. Yeah, Pete's a great guy. And another one is called The Flop House, and that's three comedy writers, and I think two of them work for like Comedy Central. These are full blown comedy writers, and they deal with big budget disasters, and they've discussed all three of them: yours, Pete's podcast, and the the last one that I just mentioned, The Flop House. They all increase my my film vocabulary, my bad film vocabulary, really. You see, I have incredibly bad taste in movies. Uh, I, it's just something I have to admit to, and I make that part of my presentation. And I have to ask the question, like, do I have bad taste in movies? 
And there's, I just look at these films with a gentle eye and say, okay, this was terrible, this was terrible, but that one monster scene was was great, and the rest of it was was hokum. That's the approach. Sure, and I think that's kind of the approach that uh, a lot of us take when it comes to the fandom or the enjoyment of these movies. That we know that on technical levels, there's a lot lacking, but right. we can't help but enjoy ourselves when we watch them anyway. Right, right. What was that um, That very atmospheric, it had a lot of organ in it, uh, Carnival of Souls. Right. I love that film. That, oh, it's wonderful. I, I would not change a single cell, a, a, a second of that film. And it was done for next to nothing, but it was just such a, a beautiful, almost accident. And um, yeah, I'm not going to bash that movie. I'm, a, a beautiful accident. I love that. A beautiful accident. That's wonderful. Forgive me. I'm, I'm getting a little off topic because um, I haven't talked to you in a while, but nah. what would you like? What would you what would you like to know about Bad Film Agogo or or my love of Ed Wood? Well, when did you first discover Ed Wood? Um, I'm a little older than you. I don't know if you guys realize this, but Derek and I both have the same birthday. I'm not going to tell you what that is. And <laughs> I'm going to leave that up to the audience. But I'm a little older than Derek, and but he may remember a movie that came out called It Came From Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, on cable TV in the 80s. And there was a wonderful segment devoted to Ed Wood. And John Candy and Dan Aykroyd did a scene in drag together that was just amazing. And it really got you thinking about this guy. Before that, there was a, a book called The Golden Turkey Awards, which really solidified Ed Wood as the quote unquote worst director of all time. And that was written by um, Harry and Michael Medved. That book was the introduction to me of bad films and, oh, they're so bad, they're good and all of that. But upon later reading, I found the book to be uh, quite mean spirited. Um, I, di- I didn't, the, the guy was just trying to make a buck off of the suffering of a man who's dead and that the movie was terrible and it just it, it was just mean and I, I don't care for the mean spiritedness you wouldn't pick on a little kid's work that way you wouldn't you know find some movies do get picked on but I have a small idea of how hard it is to make a movie and I because I make short films and sometimes they don't turn out that great and it's very easy to be you know deprecating and to put them down so I would say the early 80s, the Golden Turkey Awards and the movie It Came From Hollywood were my real introduction to Ed Wood. I think that the Medved book, I mean, it's a double edged sword, right? Yeah. It, bring, it brought a lot of attention to Ed Wood because of what it was and, and such. But it really is a damning appraisal of that movie and Ed Wood. And I, I don't really agree with that approach. Yep. Um, you know, I think you and I, again, we're in sync here. And I own a copy. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's it's got some interesting material. That book introduced me to the John Wayne film, The Conqueror. So, I mean, right. it, it, it exactly. serves its purpose. <laughs> right. And, you know, the there was a book before that called The 50 Worst Movies of All Times. And that's really, there was a write-in section on the back. What is your worst movie? What is your worst director? And that's where Ed Wood was written in. And these guys were the first ones to... Take this book on a tour. They had, I think, they were playing movies, and they took it on. I remember seeing it on like morning talk shows. The Medveds would get on TV and talk about, "Hey kids, waka waka, you know, this is the worst movie of all time. This is a stinker. Oh boy!" And I was like 11, and I was very impressionable. But like my parents, I enjoyed comedy and I enjoyed laughing and to see how bad things are. And I watched a lot of Godzilla movies and there were a lot of rubber suitedness and, you know, some of the things were a little silly. But so it was an acquired taste or really imprinted into my DNA. But, you know, it stayed with me. And eventually I did see the movie Ed Wood and that just completely blew me away. I just adored this man's story although highly stylized and it was more of a Tim Burton film. I just enjoyed how the story of, of this man's his struggle to get movies made and he was really bad at it, but he was incredibly charming and he somehow got, you know, Bell Lugosi involved. He got Tor Johnson involved. He got a whole, you know, he somehow managed to scrape the money together to get these movies done. And that's incredible. That, That is a wonderful story of sticking to it. That's what that is. I recently read uh, Dolores Fuller's autobiography. Really? I had not read that. 
you know, it's it's pretty good, and she doesn't have a negative thing to say about Eddie at all. She she's a little frustrated by how some of the things turned out with uh, Bride of the Monster and, and how that whole thing played out, but. She has nothing but kind things to say about him uh, and, and talks about how charming he was, how charismatic he was. He was a wonderful dancer, just, wow. just a really great guy to be around, you know. And we picked up on that a little bit in the movie Ed Wood, you know, with Johnny Depp. Yeah. But to hear her say it, and I would have thought that she would have had a more negative approach because I didn't really know much about her. I only knew right. of her through the films and then Sarah Jessica Parker's portrayal. Right. No, not at all. That, nothing could be further from the truth, according to her autobiography anyway. And it was just, you know, to, to have known Ed Wood seems to have been a real privilege for her. Yeah. And I, and she, I would have loved to have met the guy. Come on. Right. I think she left him out of self-preservation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, she left him when he was really bottoming out and she did go on to write songs for Elvis and I forgot who else, but that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good, you know, she really did write by herself. Sure. So Nat King Cole, she wrote songs for Nat King Cole, but she, every interview I have seen, I have a few documentaries about Ed Wood um, and some of them are a little conflicting and some of the stories you hear are, are a little conflicting. And you and I have spoken at length about what could or could not be true or, and that's also part of the fun for the, the real Ed Wood nerds who really want to get into the weeds about this guy's story and I think it's just fascinating. But yeah, that she didn't, it seems like everybody who was involved with him really didn't have many bad things to say about him. They said he died of alcoholism, yeah. you know, that he, he drank himself to death, which was uh, tragic. It really yeah. is unfortunate. I mean, this is, a, this is a guy who's had such impact yep. on pop culture. And, and, and uh, the pocket of subculture that we like to play in, you know, these B-movies, these yes. quote-unquote bad movies, monster movies. I mean, he had such an impact. And, I mean, he worked with Lugosi for crying out loud. So, of course, he's monster kid royalty in a way. Yes, he is. Absolutely. But the way things kind of turned out for him is just so unfortunate and so sad. And, man... It would be hard to watch, and I don't know if anyone pr would produce it, but I would actually love to see somebody make a film that picks up where Ed Wood left off just after Plan 9, and they walk out of the theater and, you know, take the, take the movie then from to where he dies. And that would be hard to watch because he did, you know, get into pornography and, and he drank himself into a, a complete liver failure and he couldn't afford a, a, a ratty apartment in Los Angeles, in, in a Los Angeles slum. You know, I personally like to read biographies on people that I'm interested in because I'm interested in the whole story. I want to know if these people were difficult or jerks or whatever. So sure. um, there's a lot of very good books about Ed Wood. I mean, there's as much... That if you if you want to read about this guy, there's as much as you want. Your interest level will be met. If you want to just read one small book, there it's there. If you want to read five books, they're there. And um, it's impressive how much how much content there is about this man. I mean, he left us a great deal of content as well, obviously, the yes. movies. But he was also a prolific writer. And yes. a lot of his material has been published or republished yep. lately. Uh, there's this material coming out. Uh, I am about halfway through the book Hollywood Rat Race by Ed yep. Wood right now. Uh, have you read that book? I have read that. Ironically, I found Hollywood Rat Race in a bookstore within the last ten years in the budget rack. So it still had that. Oh. It still had that <laughs> Ed Wood curse of just being ninety percent off. And I'm like, well, I got to read this. And the book, was, uh -huh. the book was very insightful. He typed that. And those yeah. were his words. And you could see it, the book's a little messy at times, but it gives you really good insights how this man thinks. He didn't think much of writers, but he did think everything about, you know, the, the, the film community. And um, I, I found that to be very surprising. And he wrote like two kind of quasi sleazy action adventure novels, you know, Let Me Die in Drag and uh, Killer in Drag. And when you read these two books, when he writes about, drinking alcohol or when he writes about women's the, the fabric of women's clothing he becomes you know shakespeare it, it, it is so incredibly descriptive 
<laughs> and you can get either of those books for like a dollar each on Amazon. You can get them gently used. These are not pornography. They get a little close to, you know, they will almost make a, a prude person like me uncomfortable. But those two books are a very enjoyable read. And they also give you a, a peek into the, the mind that could write such a thing. So that, that, that was fascinating. That those, those two books were fascinating. When I first started reading Hollywood Rat Race, I just had to chuckle because it's presented as this how you're going to make it in Hollywood right. kind of style book. Right. And it's written by a guy who never made it, didn't really make it to that level. And, it, you know, it, but it's really interesting to see his take on what he thought it meant to make it in Hollywood and, and the things that you had to do to maybe get there. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it. And like you said, it comes from him. He was a very uh, fast typer. Yes. He was very quick at that. Uh, so he would just sit as, as a typewriter and just bang things out. Yeah, he was a very good schmoozer. I think he knew how to. Oh, yeah. I think he knew how to what we call network now. And it's a shame. Once again, if he didn't drink himself to death, the guy would have died. A minor celebrity. He may have even directed again. Yeah. There is one documentary and Paul Marco is being interviewed, and he would talk about Ed Wood. He could actually multitask, and he would sit on the edge of a, of a coffee table, and he had this typewriter, and he would just hammer away on this typewriter working on a script. And he would have a cigarette in his mouth, and he would have a full-blown conversation with somebody in one end of the room, and he would have the television on and whatever was on at the time. He was a you know voracious consumer of entertainment. So he'd be watching television, having a conversation with somebody and typing the script all at the same time. And that's impressive. Yeah, the scripts are probably bad, but that, that still impresses me. You know, I have a hard time making one piece of mind rot animation a year. And if some if my cat comes in and bothers me, I'm totally distracted and would rather pet the cat. <laughs> Ed Wood could fire through and do all of these things. He was a dynamo. Yeah. That was very impressive. I, I hope your I hope you and your listeners do eventually look up, start to watch these documentaries. Um, there are a number of them. Well, just to kind of give listeners an idea as to what's out there, what are some of the documentaries that you would consider must watches when it comes to learning about Ed Wood or Plan Nine? Derek, I'm going to walk over to another part of my office. Okay. So um, hold on a sure. second. I'm going to walk over here and find where my Ed Wood stuff is. Ah, here we go. All right. This is good. Yeah, and I'll take some more. And there's another one. All right. You ready? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Vampire of the movie. There are two Vampire documentaries, and Ed Wood does play heavily in this because that's her most significant role. So there's Vampire of the movie by Alpha Video, and there's one called Vampira and Me. Okay. Um, another one is called The Haunted World of Edward D. Wood Jr. That is one of the better ones. It's a very good documentary, okay? I would recommend that. Ed Wood, Look Back in Angora. This came out from Rhino Video, which I don't even know if they're around anymore. This came out the same year as the movie Ed Wood. They didn't even have to advertise for it. That is, This is a great documentary. Okay, It's a lot of fun. Ed Wood, Look Back in Angora. I can I can attest to that. It's, it's a good documentary. You've I seen have it? seen that one. That's really good. I did not know that, Derek. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy for you. On the Trail of Ed Wood, hosted by Conrad Brooks. Now, Conrad Brooks is one of the few Ed Wood players that he was a kid when he was working with Ed Wood. He was a teenager. And this is one of the first documentaries that actually put Ed Wood in a positive light. This was made some time ago. And people were starting to say, hold on a second. This guy is not the worst filmmaker in all time. Let's just hold your horses. And there is Flying Saucers Over Hollywood, which is... So, which, is, which is purely a documentary about Plan 9 from Outer Space. And that is a great documentary. That is a heck of a lot of fun. The guy actually found the graveyard where Bell Lugosi was flicking his cape and they found, you know, Tor Johnson's house. And from the movie to how things look now, the palm trees are like 50 feet tall. But that's a, that, that one is also a heck of a lot of fun. Now, bear in mind, some of these documentaries do conflict a bit and you you know people i think they have their own idea of edward's story 
And you could watch these things and expand your understanding of it a little bit. Or if you just don't, if you feel you don't want to believe one versus the other, that's completely cool too. Some of these people who were being interviewed were also getting a little older in in age, and maybe the mind was starting to go. I'm not sure, but um, those were all absolutely wonderful documentaries, and I would highly recommend them to anybody. Once you are done listening to the Plan Nine by Nine podcast. <laughs> Start with that first. That is your introductory. That is your gateway drug to (laughs) the world of Ed Wood. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. (laughs) My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Yeah, I've seen uh, a couple of those. I don't think I've seen them all that you've mentioned. And, of course, you know, I go on YouTube and try to find everything I can about Ed Wood. Joe Blevins at one point was writing a lot about Edward on his blog. Uh, So, you know, I just, I try to consume as much as I can, but it does get difficult because towards the end of his career, he wasn't making the genre films. He wasn't making the monster movies. It was all kind of the soft core exploitation stuff that I don't have as much of an interest in, to be completely honest. And And they're, they're on watch. Yeah. I'm like I said before, I'm a prude and I can't, I, I just couldn't, well, I have an audio version of, um, not Night of the Ghouls. What was the uh, the one where everyone was dancing? Ah, Orgy of the Dead. Orgy of the Dead, right. I had a copy of that, and I couldn't watch it because I'm such a prude. I just don't I, – I don't get any – there's no va- entertainment value to this. But so I but I do have the audio recording of it. So I was like, ah, oh, that's fine. <laughs> you say that. But the thing about that particular film, yeah, I don't know why, but I'm kind of obsessed with it. <laughs> that's great. Derek, there's, th- th- know? that's what we're talking about. There's entertainment value to this yeah. man's story, and everybody he touches somehow becomes part of this terrible orbit. Not terrible orbit, but messed up, bad filmmaking orbit. And you find if you can make a few bucks out of, off of it a few years later, you know, I didn't even know if that Greek filmmaker is still alive. But um, that's great. You know, if you if you there is some entertainment value out of it. Yeah, uh, the director of Orgy of the Dead, uh, Stephen C. Apostoloff, or A. C. Stevens, is the name yep. he used there. Uh, I have not seen it, but there is a documentary about him that came out a couple of years ago called "Dad Made Dirty Movies." Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's not been released physically here in the states, but it is available on Vimeo. And, right. uh, you know, I keep meaning to go and watch it. I just haven't done it yet. And I just discovered now, talking with you, I'm not sure why I didn't even bother to look this up before, Orgy of the Dead is on Blu-ray, for crying out loud. Yeah, it deserves a Blu-ray release. You know, you really need to, see, yeah, you need to see that, in, you know, in, in high def. It, uh, you know, there, there may be subtleties you lose. Um, <laughs> the, I just the, want high definition Criswell is what I want. Right, high def Criswell and uh, you know Silver Fawn or whatever the hell her name is. And uh, <laughs> I think they had two redhead leads. It, I think he actually, if I read, remember correctly, the the female lead in the film who was chained up, uh, they may have used two of them. But you know, this is soft core. Um, have you ever seen I Woke Up Early the Day I Died? I have not, but that's been on my list for a while. That's great. I, I love that movie so much, and it does. It is pretty faithful to an Ed Wood script. Some people don't like it, and some people say, "Oh no, it's not Ed Wood. It's not Ed Wood," because it doesn't have the crazy dialogue. Ed Wood could write these this mind bending, almost not a tongue twister of a dialogue, but I can't. I didn't even have the words to describe Ed Wood dialogue. But I woke up early the day I died. Um, has not been released here yet. I got a. I think I got a solid copy of it through some nefarious means, but it's it's very enjoyable. I mean, I think you can watch it online. Uh, there's a ton of stars in it, too. Uh, the star power be- behind that 1998-1999 production is inspiring. That's another reason you have to take a second look at Ed Wood. This guy is not a loser. This guy is not no. a... Well, he died. He did. He refused to take care of himself, and he drank himself into you know, into oblivion. But his story is a million dollar property. Yeah. So. And you know, he didn't really have the resources to take care of himself. And you know, we understand mental health differently now. And I'm, I'm 
would be shocked if there weren't some mental health issues at play uh, with what happened with him and his life and everything. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about the trans facility. That's not what I mean. But No, no. He you was, know, but, but addiction is terrible. And you know, yeah. he, he was an alcoholic. And it, it, it really took from us a lot of genre legends. And yeah, I'll include Ed Wood in there. You know, Lon Janey Jr., Ed Wood. The yeah. ghost, he said she was with morphine or, or whatever. I mean, it, it, it's terrible to know that that happened, but... Huh. Right. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm going to a dark place. So, <laughs> right. I felt bad for Ed Wood because with his personality, he would have been a phenomenal car salesman. Oh yeah, he would have cleaned up on the convention circuit. Right. He just, but but just saying, when his movies hit bottom, and if he was not a savage drinker, he could have gone off to sell copy machines. You know, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. I mean, but he could have made a living off of it, and then his movies were starting to become popular around the time that he passed away and there was just he just he just missed it he just missed it and it's so heartbreaking but yeah you know, it is it's, it is what it is i mean we we're, we're here now to to celebrate um i think he was buried at sea i think he 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 had, was cremated and they put his ashes at sea and you you can't there's not even a gravesite that that's 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 a shame for me but i had not heard that yeah, his wife is buried somewhere in Hollywood in a particular cemetery that is a home to a colony of feral cats and a number of celebrities as well. That's fascinating. Wow. Yeah, 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 so. Hmm. So I do a presentation called Bed Film Go Go. Yeah, so this is something you do at, you've done at a couple of conventions over the years, right? Yes, yes, I've been doing that for about two years now. I take my history and love of bad movies, and I'm a little defensive of them. I'm going to say that they're not terrible. But, you know, like I said, we've talked about B-movies, and we, when you watch a B-film, there are wonderful moments. The monster was good. The actor was good. You're not just turning it off because this was terrible. Something really imprinted on me. So I, did a, I made a presentation about the love and enjoyment of, of bad movies, or, or how you enjoy them. And I start with like uh, Reefer Madness. I go all the way up to modern movies like The Room and Birdemic Shock and Terror. Wow, okay. And those are both really bad movies. Sure. But almost half of the presentation is devoted to talking about the legacy of Ed Wood after he died. And you could not, but I still haven't hit bottom with all the, the books and the, and the movies and the documentaries that have come out. There was a Plan 9 video game that I, I spoke to a guy who was actually trying to construct an old PC so he could play it. You know, it requires a certain operating system and all that stuff. It's incredible at how much this man's legacy, how much how many people were making, um, making a little bit of money off of the Ed Wood story. And I would just go on and on about, you know, okay, and then this year this happened, and the next year this happened. And at the finally, at the end of it, I would take everything that I mentioned and I would put it up all on one slide. And you would have anywhere from 18 to 24 different book covers, video games, documentaries, Don Post masks up on one screen. And I asked the question, I'm like, is this guy the worst director of all time? Is this guy a loser? And everybody is speechless. And so that's and then I go on to Robot Monster and I'm done with talking about Ed Wood. But people are really left in awe of of how much has been devoted to this guy's life and legacy. You, you mentioned Don Post, the Tor Johnson mask. I mean, that was famous. It's famous. It's iconic at one point, And I don't know if it still is or not, but at one point it was the best selling mask from Don Post. Right, and I don't think many people know that it came from Plan 9. Right. Maybe there was another Tor Johnson movie where he had a scar on his head, but he's mostly remembered for his Plan 9 work because it was awesome. You know, this gigantic bare walrus of a man with, with this crazy zombie makeup. It must have been terrifying looking. Yeah. So I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. And every once in a while, somebody will chime in from the audience and said, you know, there was an operating system for uh, a high-end computer that was named... Plan Nine, or as as a mild homage. So, like my other research, when you speak to people, you find out more. Okay. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's just to just to go back to speaking about 
Ed Wood. I don't shame people. I'm not going to, you know, you do meet a lot of folks at this presentation who absolutely adore riff tracks and mystery science theater. And I'm not going to put anyone down. I, I personally don't watch those as much as I had used to. Don't get me wrong. Riff tracks and a mystery science theater has done more for the love of bad movies than anything in history. Oh, totally. They have made it they have made it fun and popular and cool. And I have met people who started to buy they buy movies on Rift just to see what it was like, just to make their own opinion. There you go. That that effect is also happening as well. You know, I know you're friends with a lot of horror hosts. Mm -hmm. And I've met a few in my day as well. And, you know, they're they're more concerned about the comedy and their own brand. And they may completely shred a movie and try to get some, you know, some some jokes in there. All right, that's fine. It's it's all open game. Um, these are not necessarily good movies that are worth defending. <laughs> I'm just trying to say that these things are really hard to make. And Ed, Ed Wood's story is, it is mammoth. When you look at it, you know, it's 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 incredibly impressive. Yeah. So. And, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, the, the MedFed book being what yeah. really kind of made Plan 9 a bigger part of, of pop culture right. and, the, and, the, yeah. and the zeitgeist. Similarly, MST3K did the same thing with a lot of movies. You know, it, it seems like if there's something out there that does become a little critical, whether it's playful or not, it just kind of propels it forward, whether it's plan nine, whether it's Manos, the hands of fate, you know, yep. these things. And because of that, I can't fault them. I can't say, man, I wish Medved didn't say that about Ed Wood, because if he didn't, would we have the Ed Wood, I don't want to say Renaissance, but the presence of Ed Wood's material out there now, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of a, again, double edged sword. Right. I'm not, and who am I to judge? You know, right. people, this is a free country and people are entitled to their own opinions. And, you know, they're, I have an audience because I am that welcoming. And I'm like, you have an opinion. Say it. It's more than welcome. We're here to celebrate bad movies. We're here to celebrate why we love these things. Right. And people get really excited and they feel smart and they feel validated and they come up to me or they want to chime in about some other movie that they saw or how or how them and their friends they all got loaded and, you know, watch a particular film and had a, you know, a ripper on good time with it. I have seen a gr some success at being this bad film shepherd. So <laughs> that's yeah. a good way to put it. The shepherd yeah. of these movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so while you've done this presentation over the years, what are some of the misconceptions that you've come across that people have about Ed Wood? Not many people have done as much research as I have, so they're very comfortable with saying he's the worst director of all time. But also, that term "worst director of all time" is something that that changes every 10 years because a new movie comes out that's a real piece of junk mm -hmm. and that becomes the the worst film of all times. You know, back a, a decade ago, it was Troll 2. Now it would be uh, Birdemic, Shock and Terror, or The Room. It's, it's all time relative. So misconceptions about Ed Wood, I, I really haven't found that much. Okay. It, it, people want to share their stories about enjoying it but they largely believe the movie, Ed Wood from 93. It may not be picture perfect, but if, you're, if that's what you're going to believe, I'm okay with that. Sure. If, if that's what you're going to watch, that movie did end with that soaring music and talking about how everybody went on to do things. And I, I found that very charming. Yeah, the story was a little, a little pie in the sky, but... You know, that's if there's any misconception, that's what I find is that they believe that movie is Bible. The thing about that film, um, no, it's not historically accurate at all. No. Uh, you know, it portrays Ed Wood and Dolores Fuller and especially Bela Lugosi in ways that their contemporaries or other reports have said very contradictory to who they really were. But right. there is still a vibe uh, to that film uh, that's very inspiring to me as a creative. Right. You know, and back then, you know, I thought I was going to go on to make movies myself, so you know, I really right. glommed onto that. Right. And, you know, I got to see Bela Lugosi do some stuff. No, he probably didn't swear as much as he did in the film. He was more of a gentleman in real life, more than like but, you know, you still get to see somebody playing Bela Lugosi and, you know, win an Oscar for it. Right. Yeah. Correct. Edward Story won two Oscars. Is the word now? Is he the worst director of all time? Is he a right. leader? No, not at all. This man is a mammoth. 
He's very he, he drank himself to death. I understand that. But his story won two Academy Awards. That is impressive. 100 percent of all the awards that it was nominated for at the Academy Awards, it took. I don't think any other film that year right. that was nominated for multiple awards took everything home. And this one did. From what I understand, when I saw the Martin, L- I saw I met Martin Lando at a convention. I had to pay forty dollars to meet him. I don't know the man, didn't know the man personally, so don't let, sure, me, let, sure. me, let me put that in context. I am, I am, <laughs> I, I'm a working stiff just like everyone else. Okay. So I, I I shell that was my most expensive autograph. I don't usually do this, but it was he's I I'm such a fan of this movie, and he he was very gracious and he was incredibly cool, and we talked about it. And we talked about how somebody had asked a question about his speech during the Academy Awards was cut short. Yeah. And he was trying to offer praise to Bell Lugosi. He, he just confirmed that, yes, they, they cut me short. And he was very upset about it. And, um, and so that was that was really about it. He was very respectful. Um, I do remember that as well. I was frustrated because I knew they played him off. But uh afterwards behind you know behind with the press conference area or whatever he did mention Lagosi. so at least he got a little bit in there you know the guy who was doing the martin landau interview was a gentleman named roy frumkus he was the guy who produced uh street trash okay that's personally one of my favorite splatter films but it's well outside of the scope of this conversation and this <laughs> podcast so i understand that um i shouldn't like that movie as much as i do but i do like it so anyway Mr. Frumkis, who's a very nice man, was talking with Martin Landau and they were both, he said, you know, it turns out that Ed Wood is a lot of people's uh, favorite Tim Burton movie. Sure. So whatever that means to you, that's it. I think you agree as well. You know, I think it is my favorite Tim Burton film. And yeah. And part of it's because of the music. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I know Tim Burton typically works with Danny Elfman, but in this case, he didn't. And I think yeah. the movie is better for it. The, the two writers of Ed Wood also came from failed movie projects. And this movie, Ed Wood, was very important to them because one of them was part of the movie Problem Child, which had its own, which was supposed to be its own film and got completely morphed into something else out of his control. So these two writers really liked ed wood because of the story and because it was so validating and successful and they published the script and i bought this on a lark and i found it on amazon for a few bucks and it turns out the first time i opened the book the first page and there's the two signatures of these two guys i got like a signed copy (laughs) wow of this of this movie right but it was another one it was another part of the ed wood legacy and curse that you know, no matter what, these productions are in like the, the dollar basement. That's how they're being sold. Yeah. I just found that to be very comical. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of neat. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's just I, it's just part of my Ed Wood collection. Yeah, hold on a second. You'll like this. Okay. I have a few Ed Wood books that are very important to me. Nightmare of Ecstasy is, is what Ed Wood 1993 was based on. Right. Have you read it? Uh, I have. It's uh, Rudolph Gray is the author on that, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. I, th- I think, yeah, I did. I haven't read it in a while, but yeah, I did. One that really blew me away recently was The Cinematic Misadventures of Ed Wood. Ooh. And that's one that confirmed a lot of my beliefs about uh, the current state of Ed Wood and how much he's being picked on. And the book was very frank about what he was like and, you know, in his last years. And he was a bit of a surly drunk and he was he, he was at times nasty and abusive. And and once again, I like documentaries and I like to find out what people were really like. There's a book called Ed Wood, Mad Genius. This book is trying to say that all of his movies are actually quite good and they're misunderstood genius cinema. So I, I haven't had I haven't had the heart to read it because if Ed, <laughs> Wood, if Ed Wood was a true genius, he wouldn't have died a penniless drunk. It's a beautifully made book. I think it's from McFarlane, but I personally don't. I, I have a hard time believing that the man was a genius. So I think he was very charming. I think he was good at people. He, he knew how to get something done on a shoestring. Sure, it's fine. Hollywood Rat Race. That's my copy. Uh, Killer in Drag and Death of a Transvestite. Those two books you can get for a song on on Amazon or get gently used copies. They're a very quick read, and you get to read about how well he describes the fabric of women's clothing and how he describes 
hard liquors going down his throat. It's <laughs> it's almost creepy, but you get to see this guy. He's, he 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 can really describe things. And then there was a very rare book called The Muddled Mind, the complete works of Edward D. Wood Jr. Kind of brief synopsis of his writings. You know, being a collector of the whole Edward saga, I couldn't resist picking these things up. Sure. So you have to forgive me. I'm on the other side of my office trying to put something away. It's all right. It's really good podcasting, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, here it is. This is Ed Wood, the screenplay written by Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski. Uh, this is a Borders autographed copy. There they are, these beautiful two signatures. And I was, I was like, ah, this is cool. And, and I was like, I didn't know I, I bought an autographed copy. So aren't I lucky? That is very cool, actually. That is very cool. I would recommend, I don't know if you've got these or if you've had a chance to read these, uh, Bear Manor Media has a series of books called Scripts from the Crypt. Yeah. And uh, they put out one that's just about Bride of the Monster and then another yep. one about the uh, Ed Wood and the Lost Lugosi screenplays. I've got both of these books. Gary Rhodes is one of the primary authors on both of these, and he's a Lugosi scholar, does amazing work there. But to see these get, again, the serious treatment, to see these movies get a serious treatment, despite the fact everybody says, oh, they're the worst movies of all time, I think it speaks to the quality of the enjoyment that we get out of these things. Yeah. I don't quite have the eloquence that you do to describe why I do or do not like them. You know, I like what I like because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that, man. I'm not saying that these are good. I buy, you know, I, I a friend of mine lends me, you know, Robert De Niro films, and they are quite good. They're, you know, he doesn't do a lot of bad movies. And then I look out, I, I look, and I'm like, I get excited because I find a gently used version of. Of, of an Ed Wood film, and I, I get excited over it. I'm a collector of these things. It's just what I do. And you remember that we've talked previously about my love of monster movies that end up in New York City. Well, it means you have to watch a lot of bad movies to get, you know, to get the content that you need. But, you know, they have a special place in my heart and they give me all this content to talk about. So well, there you um, go. I, I have, I'm not going to bite the hand that feeds me. <laughs> Right on. Yeah, I mean, these movies, they're just... I don't like to use the phrase, they're so bad, they're good. You know, that's, yeah, that's, that's cliche. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's officially lost all of impact. Pretty much. Pretty much. But you, you, you can't help but smile and, and laugh and just have a good time watching these films, especially prime Ed Wood time, you know, Plan 9, Bride of the Monster, you know, Night of the Ghouls uh, is, is right. a really, I think, underseen film just because of how... It got locked up in the right. lab for so long. It's the Kelton the Cop slash Tor Johnson trilogy. Basically, yeah, it's a nice little Edward triptych of of you know. these films that all kind of sort of follow up on each other, but not. But yeah, you know, it's yeah, Kelton the Cop's great. I love Kelton the Cop. I love Glenn or Glenda. A, f a very dear friend of mine had mentioned that that should be a musical. I noticed that there was back a decade ago or so ago someone did make a plan nine musical and that's fine but no glenn or glenda really deserves because it has all the current tropes and my wife and i are really big fans of rupaul's drag race mm. and the, the, the show is just immensely entertaining and i'm like these guys would would uh would really be great if they could produce you know uh glenn or glenda the musical but I, I, I will keep that opinion to myself, I guess. I don't know. Well, not anymore. It's on <laughs> not anymore. Right? I just, you, you can't unring the bell. <laughs> yeah, I'm not cutting that out. I want to see that now, I think. <laughs> I think. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, Derek, what, is, what, what's, what are the plans when you have all the nine segments of Plan 9 by 9 done? I, I hear that you're going to be uh, moving on to another film. Are you allowed to talk about that here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I've even mentioned it on uh, Monster Kid Radio proper. Uh, Scott Morris right. and I are going to tackle Manos, the Hands of Fate. That's great. I'm so happy for you. That's something I would like to see here, a more serious treatment. How are you going to break it out into uh, uh, five minutes? What? Five minutes. Five, five minutes. minutes of fate will be the name of the show. Five minutes of fate. You know, and that, that's something I have the Mill Creek 50 movie set. I've never watched that movie straight. So I will do that in anticipation of um, of this new venture. You know, it's something that uh, I've watched straight. And then, of course, I've watched Drift as well. But yeah. I also uh, was part of the you know, I was a contributor to the campaign to have it restored to Blu-ray. And really watching it on Blu-ray kind of cleaned up and restored. I don't want to say it's a revelation, but it almost is. It's really interesting. Really interesting. That's wonderful, Derek. I, I did not know you were part of its, um, not renaissance, but 
kind of validation, if you will. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. I feel like there's something at the core of Monos that is terrifying. Right. I who wrote the novelization? Who wrote the novelization of Monos? Oh yeah, Stephen D. Sullivan, and he's written it twice. He wrote it as a comedy and as a straight up horror film. Right. Or horror story. That's, no, I was so I thought that was incredibly clever of him to take a public domain film and actually write the novelization. I'm like, no, this guy gets it. He found yep. a market and managed to strike. And and I love the commercial he has on the little audio spot he has on MKR. Oh, for the White Zombie one. Yeah, he did White Zombie as well. Yeah. Right. Kind of a brilliant idea to take these, these public domain films. I know a handful of people have done that. There's just a lot of, and you and I were talking off mic, there's a lot of authors that I've interacted with over the years through Monster yeah. Kid Radio who get it. And Steve's one of them. He's wonderful. I've chatted with him a little bit on, on my own, and sometimes we'll talk about monster movies, and sometimes we'll just talk about the snow on his deck. So it's... <laughs> Well, that's the other thing, too, and I kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, with Ed Wood, he would have cleaned up on the convention circuit if sure. not for things like conventions and especially social media. I mean, we now can celebrate Ed Wood. Here in the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast, and here we are having this wonderful conversation about Ed Wood and just, just smiling and having a good time. And yeah. I, you know, you, you can have a book by the Medved that says it's the worst film of all time or he's the worst director of all time. That's fine. I would have him sign that. Yeah. I would have him sign that. I know that the fella who is in Iga, the, the male lead of Iga, is still alive. And I would love to have... Oh, Arch Hall. Yeah. I would love to have him sign this book and write some expletives to the Medveds in that book. I have met him. Uh, he was at Monster Batch a few years ago, the same year that Joel from Monster Kid, or Monster Mystery Science right. Theater was there. Oh, that's right. He got a pie in the face. Yeah, I did a little shtick on stage that's where funny. he came up and pied him and said, this is for Thunderbird Pictures or whatever the outfit was. <laughs> it wasn't Thunderbird. It was uh, something else. But yeah, and, you know, they played it up. But then the very next morning they were having breakfast together. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that the book 50 Worst Movies of All Time, which which did have Ega and it had um, Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster was directed by uh, a guy named Bano, B-A-N-N-O. And he held on to the rights for one Godzilla movie for decades, and that ultimately became the 2014 Godzilla film. And once again, is this guy a loser? Does this movie deserve the, the, the harsh treatment of being maligned in that book? Yeah. Once again, it got everyone thinking about it and started that conversation. So, yeah. Right. So I just find I find that fascinating. Well, for these movies that are so-called the worst films of all time, trash, you know, terrible movies or whatever. They certainly stick around. Yeah. You know, they certainly have an impact. Right. Opinions will soften from 1978 when that was written. True. So it, uh, it does. Out of the polluted waters it came to become the most fearful menace that ever threatened mankind. <laughs> Feeding, growing ever more deadly on smog. Only one force dared stand up to its overpowering evil. Godzilla! Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. Will Godzilla, man's friend, be vanquished? More than 1,600 dead have been reported, while other casualties are expected to exceed 30,000. storage tank of the Japan oil company has exploded. Nothing man can do can stop the smog monster. Can Godzilla save the Earth from this mastodon of destruction? of a deadly cosmic ray, the Earth is invaded by indestructible moon monsters. Their ghastly mission, death for all humans. <coughs> what astounding technical developments are being made to protect mankind. 
Robot Monster brings you an actual preview of the devastating forces of our future. Unsuspected revelations of incredible horrors that will terrify you with their brutal reality. There is no escape from me. Very well. I will recalculate. Your death will be indescribable. Fool humans, there is no escape. From award-winning author Stephen D. Sullivan, White Zombie, a new novel based on the classic motion picture. What do you see? Neil asked. Madeline peered into the wine glass, pretending to be a fortune teller, and for a moment her head reeled. She did see something within the depths of the cup. Terrible dark eyes staring up at her, boring into her mind. The eyes of that awful man they'd encountered in the road. You see? She felt dizzy now, really dizzy, and her throat was tight, as if cold hands were closing around her neck. What is it? Neil asked, concerned. The eyes burned into her. She couldn't breathe. I see, she managed to gasp. Death. Available now in print and all ebook formats. Find it on Amazon, Smashwords, Drive Through Fiction, and other quality outlets. Also available in a special edition, including the complete movie script. Grab White Zombie before it grabs you. Details at sdsullivan.com. That is no other way. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. Once again, thank you for being here. I appreciate the listeners. I appreciate you listeners so much for being part of what we do here and part of the community that you all have created. I mean, this Monster Kid Radio thing, it's bigger than me. It, it's you. And I appreciate all the work that you do in helping to grow the show, whether it's retweeting tweets, sharing posts on Facebook, spreading the Monster Kid love wherever you can, letting people know about Monster Kid Radio. I just really appreciate everything about you and what you do. It's a big part of, well, the podcast. So thank you so much. You'll want to head over to monsterkidradio.net to learn everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio. Everything is over there. Links to everything that's come up here on the show. And even there is a way for you to help support the show if you're going to pick up any of the Ed Wood material that Mark brought up during our conversation. Just follow the Amazon links that I've got set up over there. That will take you to Amazon through our affiliate link, which helps the show out financially. So thank you. In advance, if you're going to do any shopping on Amazon, and I mean any shopping, if you want to pick up something that's not Ed Wood or Monster related, but you're still going to buy it through Amazon, follow the link, any of the Amazon links on our page, because you'll still be within that Monster Kid Radio affiliate, I don't know, shell or whatever. Either way, however you do it, just it helps us out. So thank you. I really appreciate it. You know what else helps us out? our patrons. And I think it's about time that we do another executive producer roll call. We are on Patreon at patreon.com slash monster kid radio for as little as $1 a month. You can help support the show. You can get certain rewards like the monster movie bingo card. Those of you who are entitled to the monster movie bingo card, you can expect that this weekend. You might also become an executive producer during our monthly roll call. It sounds a little something like this. Special thanks to our executive producers. These are people that help support the show at the Toho level or higher. They are A. Wendell, Alistair H., Andrew S., Dennis, Jonathan A., Justin G., Mitch G., Terry M., Bayou Hunter, Blaine B., Charles B., Chris M., Curtis, Don E., Jerry Green, y'all know him, James Moore, James M., Jeff P., Jeffrey O., Jim N., Karen Joan Kahodic, she's been on the show before, Michael H., Paul C., Stephen D. Sullivan, Steve Turek, T. McKay, Timothy F., Todd O., Tracy and Scott Morris, Ingrid C., Kevin Slick, another person who's been on the show before, Myron R., and Tammy 
A. This time around, I didn't mention too many last names. I'm going to start doing that because unless I know specifically that you're comfortable with me mentioning your phone name on the show, I just, I don't want to do that. Anyway, I want to thank you for helping to support the show. And even if you aren't a patron of Monster Kid Radio, oh, by the way, I probably ought to mention Kenny from All Mexico. He's on that list too. Even if you don't support the show financially through Patreon, just being here, like I said, or maybe sharing the link to our Patreon page is something you can do to help us out. What's coming up next week here on the show? Well, I'm in that Ed Wood Plan 9 clearing out the hard drive kick right now. And there's another episode that we recorded as part of the Plan 9 by 9 podcast. And it's something that people were entitled to because we had a particular stretch goal. And that was a conversation with Scott and Tracy Morris and I about the Disney film Okay, Touchstone, but technically Disney film, Ed Wood, the Tim Burton film that Mark and I talked briefly about earlier. Well, we're going to stay on the Ed Wood train. We're going to have that episode next week. Finally going to clear that out of my hard drive space and put that out there for everybody to check out. And again, if you want to check out any of the previous episodes of Plan 9 by 9 well, just go to Plan9x9.com and you'll find the Plan 9 by 9 podcast. Between now and, well, whenever, remember that Monster Kid Radio is the registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Nancy Drew's Wetsuit. That is copyright The Neptunas. 2020. It's on their album Mermaid A Go Go, which you can find at theneptunas.bandcamp.com. You can pick up the entire digital album. There's 12 tracks. It's $10. That's less than a buck a song. I think it's worth it. I think it's more than worth it. And I think you're going to like it. Check them out and let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week. Ciao.